All right. So we're going to mix things up a little bit and uh, have a bit of a fireside chat in June. It's going to be led by our CRO, Gary Eusen, and he's going to bring to the stage Sarah Sheen. And she's a commercial IT lawyer with 35 years of experience in the industry. We were talking last night, and uh, our histories go way, way back to a company called CCH. And we were trading war stories, and we said, you know, we have both been in legal tech since before there was legal tech. So she's an ardent uh, promoter of legal tech and design, and Gary's going to have a conversation with her. So please, welcome to the stage, Gary Eusen and Sarah Sheenan. Sarah. Gary. Welcome to Legato Power Up. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for making all the effort to come all the way from England to, to Prague. Um, obviously, I've known you for, well, over 20 years. Indeed. And I'll, I'll come on to that in a bit, how I know you. Um, but as John said, a little bit more background to yourself. We'll spend the next five minutes talking about your background. And uh, you've been a corporate and IT lawyer for over 35 years. First part of your career, you were working with uh, some of the biggest bands and artists in the music industry. Um, I mean, to put in the context, one of the first bands that Sarah worked with, it was the Sex Pistols. Um, I bet they kept you busy. Uh, and on your toes as well. Um, after you worked for many years at the, in the music industry, you then moved to... Um, in-house counsel for a lot of like big UK com companies and as John says there you also then worked for 10 years at one of the biggest uh, legal publishers in the world where you worked as a technical editor and worked in product development I think that's really where you got your passion for legal design yep. and then we fast forward to about 2001 and that's when we met each other that's when you joined the docking automation company yep. and me as a young sales guy I managed to sell into the child support agency is a, a big UK government department and at the time if you picked up a national newspaper probably once every six to eight weeks there would be front page headlines saying IT disaster at child support agency like hundreds of millions wasted on another IT project taxpayers money down the drain and of course I just sold into the child support agency, so I was a bit nervous about that. <laughs> now, it was a slither of the child support agency in the sense it was the appeal section, but we knew we needed somebody with experience to help deliver that project, and Sarah came and joined. And Sarah really acted as the glue between the child support agency and our developers, and basically managed to deliver this 18-month project. And it was delivered on time, on budget, and the outcomes was, instead of these appeals taking three days, they end up taking three hours. And the 300 people who actually used that system were really passionate. Probably one of the most passionate people, because these 300 people at the Child Support Agency, they were at the coalface of having to deal with the public who were calling up, and they were very emotive already. Uh, you know, this is dealing with you know, child payments, maintenance payments, so the broken relationships, children, money. And I think that's when you really got that passion for docking automation. Yep. So, and it's funny because that was a good news story. <laughs> uh, and that didn't make, from the child support agency, and that didn't make the papers, did it? No. But um, after you finished that, you then joined Keystone Law. And I think you're actually the first lawyer there. I was, and, yes, I was. And now there's hundreds of them all around the place, yep. all over the world. Um, and you worked there for 18 years, working with in-house counsel, small and large. Um, and also during that period, you, you were 15 years working on the board of a non-profit in-house counsel association yep. to do with trainings. And you used to do like 50 events a year. Yes. And sometimes I was fortunate you'd come to Edinburgh. Indeed. And we'd, we'd get to catch up and have, you know, have a cup of tea or something a bit stronger. Indeed. Um, and yeah, I'd say that's the, you know, you, you then, when you're at the Keystone Law, it got to 2001 and you kind of decided that legal work wasn't really for you anymore. You wanted to get back into that passion of the kind of digital transformation and um, automation. And, uh, and then so you've been working for a lot of kind of 
again, well-known companies like Superdry and, and House Council and trying to help them with this process. Now, if I go back to 2001 and talk about myself for a little bit here. Um, <laughs> so I carried on working for that same company for another 15, 16 years um, until we sold it. And then I, uh, I you know, left, I had a bit of a sabbatical, you know, a bit of all that. And then I um, joined a sports broadcasting company. And then uh, maybe just shy of two years ago, I started seeing this news about Legito and I spoke to, I dropped Andre a note and I, I ended up joining Legito. And uh, so the announcement went out that I joined Legito and you phoned me up and, you know, send on the best wishes. And what you said to me was really interesting because you said, you know, we've been working at this for over 20 years and sometimes it sort of feels like we're pushing water up that hill, you know. <laughs> but... Uh, but over the past three to four years, it's really changed. You've seen change. And, you know, the, the reasoning and justification for, for this technology has always been there for all that time. But the backdrop has changed. And I was just wondering if, you know, if you would like to share with the team here some of your thoughts on, on yeah. some of these changes. Yeah, I think when, when Gary first asked me to do this, I thought, well, there's all these great people speaking. What can I contribute? But I think where I come from is sort of seeing, if you like, a, a 360 degree perspective on this. Um, I've worked in private practice. Uh, I've worked with in-house departments and legal teams, small and large, though mostly small. I think most people who aren't in the profession perhaps are surprised at the size of some legal teams. Even with huge organizations, the legal teams are very small. We are costly people, so they don't have many of us generally. But I've also come at this as a supplier, so both working for the document automation company and in an earlier phase with a legal publishing company. So we were also trying to sell into lawyers and law firms. Uh, so I sort of come at these things from lots of different directions. I've also, in the course of a number of transformation projects, um, including some with Charles, who I've also worked with in a previous life. Mm -hmm. um, then we've, I've, I've sort of seen the thing from that perspective as well and seen the sorts of things that people who are looking for this type of thing are looking at. And then I started to look back over the last, well, 25 years, I suppose, that I've been involved in document automation, which I actually came across by, by accident um, when... I was clearing out a cupboard from a colleague who'd gone back to the States to join John, I think, um, and I found something called Blue Sky, some information about a, a project from the, 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 the uh, Brigham Young University, uh, mm -hmm. and I thought this was fascinating. And so I found out more about it and eventually ended up doing product development there. And I started looking at how we might incorporate that in the publishing context. And of course, Looking back over those years, that's one of the contexts that's changed. Mm -hmm. The backdrop against which all these things are happening. As Gary said, the reasons for this sort of technology haven't changed. It's all those good risk and compliance reasons. It's the efficiency gains. It's the taking away the boring stuff to leave the big brains with the things that they actually need to think about. Those are all still there, but what has changed I think sort of fall into three categories, really. Um, the first is the lawyers themselves. Um, mm -hmm. I think in that 15 years or so that I was involved with the In-House Lawyers Association, the numbers went up exponentially in terms of people that were working in-house. Uh, I think initially, when I first worked as an in-house lawyer, you were sort of almost seen as a second-class citizen. Mm -hmm you went there because you couldn't hack it in a partnership, so you, you went in-house mm -hmm. instead. Um, that's all changed, and now a lot of that power, the purchasing power particularly, is in the hands of those very in-house lawyers who had such a bad press all those years ago. The numbers have gone up hugely, so there's more of them. They're much more involved in the businesses. Um, and of course, as Charles mentioned earlier, they're now very much a different generation of lawyers. They are lawyers like Charles's son and mine, who's the same age as Charles's son, and is not frightened by any of this stuff. 
doesn't worry about breaking things, just goes ahead and does it until he gets it right. So he's the generation that are now coming along. The in-between generation, they've also now reached the point in their careers where actually they're having some influence over what happens. They're involved in some of these decisions and in a lot of cases, increasingly, they're now forcing those decisions or leading those decisions or taking their companies forward to look at these sorts of technologies and other technologies that will improve their own position and that of the businesses that they work in. Um, and of course, I think clearly the pandemic is another of those things that's had a huge impact. I actually tried to retire in, 1920, in, in 2021. Um, I did retire from the lawyering. Uh, mm -hmm. I retired from 18 years as a partner at Keystone. But actually, it was all too exciting. I've been shouting about this stuff for 20, 25 years. And actually, trying to move things forward myself whenever I went to do some work somewhere, then I would try and introduce some of these things, talk about them, get people talking about them, hopefully get them excited about it, because that's key, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but in 20 years, as you said, there was actually not all that much movement and it was a bit mm -hmm. dispiriting. But actually, the past three to five years or so, boy oh boy, that has changed. And I think the pandemic is part of that. Mm -hmm. I think um, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella had said that he'd seen two years of innovation in, in two months. months yeah. And I think that's absolutely true. And, and, and certainly when I was looking at moving out of doing the legal work, I was getting more and more involved in webinars and various things that people were doing because they had no option. Mm -hmm. They couldn't see people face to face, so there were webinars going on and so on and so forth. And I think ironically, the very isolation of people mm. increased the amount of collaboration that was going on. There are lots and lots of interesting things springing up. In the UK, there's a, an organization called Crafty Council, which is a sort of networking collaboration group for in-house counsel. Um, and I worked for a while with a, a group called Seoul Legal Council, Seoul In-House Council. And there are quite a few of those, and it's quite an isolated position to be in. Who do you mm -hmm. talk to mm -hmm. about these sorts of things, about how to do things better, what you're doing wrong, what you could be getting right? And actually, those things have mushroomed during mm. the pandemic. So actually, increase that level of collaboration. There are Slack groups going on. There are, as I say, things like Crafty Council. And I don't know whether anybody here has come across it. There's been an initiative in the UK called One NDA, um, which was an attempt by a, a legal services firm to bring about a, a universal NDA, if you like, mm -hmm. non-disclosure agreement, which clients hate paying for, mm -hmm. lawyers don't much like mm -hmm. doing, so let's find a way around it. Somehow they managed to herd those legal cats mm -hmm. to produce a document that everybody was reasonably happy with. Mm -hmm. Those sorts of collaborations, unheard of, even five years ago, it, it didn't happen. So I think there's this whole move from the lawyers themselves away from working on their own in their ivory tower to genuinely wanting to work, A, with other lawyers, but also with the businesses that they work within. Uh, so I think that's been interesting. I mean, the changes are even more stark if you go back to the actual way in which we work. I think Charles alluded to some bits earlier. When I first started, we were working with golf ball typewriters. And I mentioned this to somebody last night who didn't know what a golf ball <laughs> typewriter was. So we moved from that to laptops. And, and, and now, you know, you've got dictation going on on smartphones and other devices. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just huge. Um, when I started training, we were working with something that was called traveling drafts that basically they went via snail mail and everybody wrote on them with different colored pens to make their changes. And we've gone from that to markups going backwards and forwards by email. 
now it's being done in, in Google Docs mm -hmm. and Word documents online, so everybody can work on the same document together. Uh, so that's extraordinary. Again, you've got the sort of things moving from correspondence by fax to email. Now it's Slack and Teams and Zoom and all those things. Mm -hmm. Again, massive, massive sea change. I think there's more and more clamor from the businesses that the lawyers shouldn't be working in their ivory towers, mm -hmm. that they actually need to be part of the businesses in which they work. And as I've said, the lawyers themselves are moving away from that. They've moved away from their sort of carefully guarded fiefdom. Mm -hmm. You know, this is legal, we deal with that. Mm -hmm. Le leave it to us guys. To actually, we'd quite like you guys to be able to self-serve some of the documentation mm -hmm. and take all that stuff that doesn't really need us to be done and do it yourselves. And what solutions like Legito offer is the possibility to provide those but with the insurances for the lawyers, that all those safeguards are built in, that all the risks have been taken care mm -hmm. of, uh, and that it's, it's safe mm -hmm. to let the business get on with them. And obviously, the systems are sophisticated enough that if you try to do something you shouldn't be doing or to do something outside the parameters, uh-uh, it stops you. Mm -hmm. So the lawyers are reassured by that sort of technology mm -hmm. being in place. So. I think all those things sort of have contributed to the whole notion that the legal team has places to go and can make life better for themselves and the businesses that they work in. And I think actually all that, as well as being kick-started, if you like, by the, uh, the pandemic, I think is going to be pushed forward more quickly by the recession that seems to be mm. coming up on us and looming large. We all have heard the trite, do more with less. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to be, have to be doing even more with even less mm -hmm. as things come along. And I think in order to do that, how do we do that without these solutions? I, mm -hmm. I, I don't quite see how that can happen. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other big thing that is different is the whole data issue. I think businesses themselves and legal teams in particular are realizing that the data that they have, and some of them are only just realizing they've got data, by the way, yeah. astonishingly, but they're realizing that the data they have has a value. And I think this is the whole sort of Google, Facebook, selling that data, making use of it. Okay, not everybody's going to want to sell it, Mm -hmm. but they're realizing that it has an intrinsic value. And so again, solutions that enable you effectively to be carrying on with your business as usual, but at the same time, gathering that data to be able to make use of it in whichever way is appropriate for your department or your business is magic, mm -hmm. magic. Um, so those are the, the, that, that's the sort of the background stuff and the lawyers changing. And I think the third leg, if you like, of this stool is that the services that are on offer have also changed. Uh, I spent 10 years in publishing and during that time we moved from a huge volume of loose leaf binders with printed on paper that was so thin, if you held it up to the light, you could read both sides at the same time, mm. to CDs and DVDs. Now all those services are mostly just online with occasionally magazines or paper that goes with it, but, but they're online. And that opens up a whole new lot of possibilities. For the publishers, they can now include precedent documents. If they've got any sense, they include automated precedent documents, but those things just would not have been possible mm -hmm. 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you've moved from, uh, well, I suppose on-premise mm -hmm. solutions, but even before that, installed solutions, mm -hmm. where things came on 20 floppy disks. Mm -hmm. 
you've moved to on-premise, you've moved to hosted solutions, and now almost entirely cloud-based, mm -hmm. which takes away whole levels of pain in terms of dealing with your IT departments, getting budget for these things, getting support, all those things gone. No longer a problem. You no longer have those complicated installation routines. You just use your preferred browser, you go online and you give it a go. Mm -hmm. You just try it. Things have moved from a massive upfront commitment, not only in cost, but in resource, in time, in project planning, some of the things we've been hearing Mark talk about. They're now much more affordable options. Mm -hmm. There are things that you can do if you're a one-man law firm or a one-woman legal department. They're all possible. You're no longer tied in for the long term. You know, you can take something on an annual basis, and if it doesn't work out, you move to something else on an annual basis. Not quite that simple, but, mm -hmm. but at least it is doable. Um, you no longer necessarily have to have that, at least at the outset, complicated decision-making process. Mm -hmm. As a lawyer, I could go online and think, well, here's this solution, that solution. I can sign up for a 30-day trial. I can have a go at automating some of the documents I use every day. How easy is it? How not easy is it? Does it work? Does it not work? Mm -hmm. I can perhaps then have a little competition with my colleague. You do it the old way, I'll do it the new way, mm -hmm. see how it goes. And perhaps as a young lawyer coming into a team or a firm, how to make yourself stand out from the crowd. You know, if you're the least bit technically inclined, mm -hmm. you can genuinely give it a go. The no-code options mean that you don't have to have that technical expertise. Mm -hmm. And actually, your expertise in the document and how it should work and what you can make it do is more important mm -hmm. than having any sort of coding knowledge at all, really. Mm -hmm. Because you can just drag and drop. Mm -hmm. Pick the suggested solution mm -hmm. for what you might want to see, as we've seen in some of the workshops. Mm -hmm. So all those things are, again, all moving in the right direction. All those stars that I've been tracking mm -hmm. for so long are all starting to align. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm still here, because mm -hmm. it's too exciting. I can't leave yeah. now. I want to know what the next chapter is. Yeah. You know, what happens from here? Um, and I'm sure, Gary, that you've seen those changes as well within your role as a, a, mm -hmm. as a seller of these products. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, a big change is like you say, with the SaaS is, you know, we, we need to keep up to date with these changes because what the market's demanding. So we've got to have a very rapid development path. Um, but like you say, instead of, you know, now the solution set's so, so wide, you know, it's not just docking automation, there's, you know, workflow, there's reports, dashboards, negotiation, mm. maybe even e-signature, you know. But basically, there's lots more options for us. Before, maybe when somebody had a business problem, they need to put together lots of different solutions. And as a big company, they always want, what well, we always used to say, one throat to choke. Yeah. They don't want to be like, well, who's responsible for this, pro this integration here and, and things like that. Um, so, and also, even how it's sold, like you mentioned, people now can go to the, the most websites, they can just trial it and, mm. and give it a go. Whereas before, it used to be a big capital expense up yes. front, have to involve IT, have to commit, and it had to work. Because yes. if it didn't, then they lost their jobs, potentially. You yes. know, it's, yes. Because now with this kind of status, if you, can, you can see, you know, how's it going after like three months, six months, 12 months, mm. however long, three years uh, for a sales guy, ideally 10 years. But um, <laughs> yeah, um, so, yeah, just looking at, so you kind of looked at how the you know, solutions have changed and it's, it's just kind of the, how, how things have swung, really. That's really. I think that's right. And I think that's the point. I think that the, you know, you've, instead of desperately trying to shoehorn one solution to work with the other because your business, you know, m m might have used a particular CRM system and how do you tie that up with what the lawyers are doing? You don't want to repeat things. APIs, what were they mm -hmm. 10 years ago? Even if they existed, you couldn't get them. Mm -hmm. you could, you, it cost you a lot of money. That was extra. Mm -hmm. uh, now, they're there. You can use them. You can do what you need to do with them. You can get on with all that. You can... You don't need that whole bank of 
development experts necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about the child support agency. A lot of what I did was sitting between the guys and the documents and the processes that they needed and explaining those to the developers as to how they needed to go about their automations. So I was the link between because the developers would usually know little if anything about the documentation but as a lawyer and, and document worker if you like that was where I came in because the guys that knew about the documents weren't aware of what potentially the software could do for them you no longer need me as the middleman mm -hmm. because because actually you can do both mm -hmm. and, and and it's been talked about elsewhere about who are the best people to get involved in these projects mm -hmm. do you use the center of excellence to do that or you do you leave it to the subject matter experts you didn't used to have the option mm -hmm. now the option is there and all the options seem to me to be swinging back towards the customer and away from the supplier we've talked about how the Legito has developed in response, I think John mentioned it in his introduction, in response to the changes that the users are asking for. And I've been involved with Legito for about the last 18 months or so now. In, and the change in the product in that space mm -hmm. of time has been enormous. Mm -hmm. And I've had conversations with people at Legito and a few months down the line, here comes another new set of developments. Oh yeah, another box ticked off. That didn't happen. Boy, mm -hmm. oh boy, that didn't happen. If you were lucky, you'd get a glimpse into the roadmap. Mm -hmm. But as to getting anything yourself as a customer on that roadmap, oh no, 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 mm -hmm. don't do that. Yeah. So I, I, I think what we've got is a sort of perfect storm of change, really. And if ever there was a time, now is it. Mm -hmm. to actually go away and do this because all those stars are now aligned mm -hmm. and, and everything is in favor of the people who are looking to use this stuff as opposed to those who are trying to do it. And as a seller, having been on the sales side, it used to be really, really difficult to get anything into in-house teams in particular mm -hmm. because part of because they didn't necessarily speak to other departments, they worked very much on their own. As a supplier, you would very often manage to get through to the IT department. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, I've got this great product and your lawyers would love it. They don't need anything. They never ask me for anything, they're fine. Mm -hmm. They just do lawyers' stuff. Mm -hmm. And you could never get at the lawyers. Mm -hmm. Now, because of webinars on these things, because you can go and try things, the demand is coming from lawyers themselves who are saying, look, you know, this is what we need. Does your product do that? No? Okay, we'll find another one. Mm -hmm. There didn't used to be that choice. Mm -hmm. I think 250 document assembly systems, document automation mm -hmm. systems out there. Big problem now is how do you make, how do you start making that choice? Not, okay, well, I can't have that one. That's all there is. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's a big, big change. Um, and I think the fascinating thing for me has been to see how many of these and other types of solutions now are coming out of new startups that have been set up by in-house lawyers mm -hmm. and Legito is a case in point mm. Andre is an ex in-house lawyer mm -hmm. um, and there are several companies like that and you have to think to yourself well why have these guys felt they have to do that and it's because the solutions that were there were a bit stuck in a time warp, really, and hadn't moved much because they had their sacred cow income from all those guys who'd bought in many years ago for big money, spent lots of money on developments, and were sort of stuck with the project. Mm -hmm. Not the case anymore. The market is yours mm -hmm. as opposed to yours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from where I sit, that's a good thing. Yeah, oh, excellent. Excellent. Well, I think we're getting very close to kind of uh, wrapping up here. I mean, we'll probably continue this conversation. Um, no doubt. No <laughs> doubt. Backstage or something like that. <laughs> but, uh, or probably on the phone. I mean, it's just a bit different now as we're doing it face to face rather Indeed. than over Zoom. Yes. And usually it gets a bit ranty as well. You know, that's usually. Oh, yeah, we do get a bit cross sometimes. Yeah, yeah that's but true. I was just wondering any, any final point you want, want to make, Sarah, before? 
I think I've sort of, I sort of looked, looked back and looked now. Mm -hmm. And I think looking forward, I think some of the conversations that I've been having lately have been fascinating because actually what they're starting to do is turn the conversation around to become customer centric. And I think this is something that the legal profession has been quite late in coming to. A lot of businesses have done that. A lot of businesses have turned around and looked at themselves through the other end of the telescope. And my view has always been that, certainly in the sense of legal contracts as opposed to documents more generically, I've always viewed them and worked with them on the basis that they should be something akin to a business relationship user manual. Mm -hmm. And that they're actually useful. And for so many decades, they've been documents that have been useful for client, for, for, for the lawyers, not necessarily for the people who are having to deal with those relationships on the ground. And I think this is getting there. I've started becoming very interesting and interested in the whole legal design movement, mm -hmm. looking to make things more usable. The conscious contracting movement, again, making things better for the user. And I think solutions like Legito, combined with that, combined with all those things, are, will force things backwards and force us to look through the other end of the telescope to say, is what we are doing as lawyers fit for purpose for the lawyers who are there? So that's how I think it will go. I think we will move, as John said, when we first started, there was no legal tech. For a bit, there's been legal tech. I think there will be for a bit more. But I think increasingly there's going to be business tech mm -hmm. because all these solutions will apply across the wider business. Perfect, perfect. That's a great way to wrap it up. Um, I can see John waving at me frantically. Onto the seat. So, <laughs> so Sarah, many thanks for sharing your insight. Thank um, you for inviting me. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Yes. Okay, thank Lovely. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.